In today's video, my friend and I return to our industrial paradise. Upgrades will be made and barriers will be broken because in our world, progress never stops. Watch as we go from simple money machines to blocks that build entire bases for you. You guys wanted a part two and here it is. I hope you're comfortable because ladies and gentlemen, today Noah and I are going for 200 days in the mod pack, create above and beyond. Hey you, do you want to play mod packs? Do you want to play them with friends? Single player gets pretty lonely, huh? Then head on over to Bisect Hosting, a great place with great prices for all your server hosting needs. They support so many mod packs that I have yet to find one that they don't. Use code DOUBLESAL at checkout for 25% off your first order. Bisect Hosting, a great site for great servers, because hanging out with pigs, it gets pretty old. It felt so good to be back in this mechanized mod pack. And last time we learned so much. We had a lot to do and very little time to do it. So the first thing we did was upgrade some of our buildings. And thanks to the machines we had, getting the materials was gonna be a breeze. But seriously, these were some pretty handsome upgrades. Like many of the greats, we start our adventure at the bottom, or in this case, underground, in a site that will become our new brass refinery. Now if you already forgot, you can melt metals in this mod, and then you can mix those metals to make new metals. So this whole area was gonna be dedicated to that. Melting the metals, mixing the metals, and making new stuff. And the main thing that we wanted to make was brass, a combination of copper and zinc. You see, we were in the brass age, and a lot of our machines required that specific material. And every machine in that factory was gonna be powered by our windmill. Although it was a pain having to climb all the way to the top just to switch it on. I'm sure there was a better way to do it, but you know me, couldn't be bothered to figure it out. I went back below when I was pleased to see that the windmill was already doing its job. So I decided to go back to the surface. We still didn't have an enchanting table, so I grew sugarcane for paper. You probably also noticed that my shaders are off now. Well, that's because my game was starting to lag, and I'm guessing it's because of all the machines that we were running. So I decided to tinker with the settings, and this happened. There was a glitch where the textures for tons of blocks just disappeared. Even in the forest! None of the trees had leaves, and it really reminded me of those old Herobrine hauntings. So I turned the shaders back on, but that didn't seem to solve the lag issue. So I decided to get back to work. I needed to get some more leather. You see, there wasn't a single cow on this island. Animals just stopped spawning. A result of our progress. Anyways, there was a crafting recipe. All I needed to do was combine a bunch of rotten flesh, and then I got rotten leather. Put that in a furnace, and boom! You have regular leather. After that, I went to go kill some time by working on the brass machine. I built a couple of smelters to melt down the copper and the zinc. I connected the smeltery to the mixers, and we were set. All we had to do now was test it. But first it was time to harvest our sugar cane. After that we made books, followed by bookshelves, and oh my goodness, is that who I think it is? Anyways, we finished the machine, and then after that it was time to beautify the area. I even installed one of those trading blocks so that we could buy copper and zinc from the market. Reason being was that if this was going to be effective, then we needed a lot of ingots and a lot of money. And there's no money in here! <laughs> More on that later. Once the ingots were melted and mixed, the molten brass was pumped through the pipes and ended up in a nice vat on the second level. There were two other vats, one for copper and one for zinc, but it was gonna be a while until we filled those as well. Now I do wanna say that everything was running smoothly, because everything was running smoothly, everything except my frame rate, so we're turning the shaders off. Sorry. After that I killed some zombies, got some XP, and finally finished building the enchantment table. Though I couldn't enchant because I didn't have enough XP, so that was gonna have to wait again. Now it was time to get back to work. If you remember in the last video, we started an assembly line, but we didn't finish it. We got as far as making the electron tubes, those little red bulbs, but after that, that was it. We also had a second problem. The factory wasn't fully automated. We were powering everything with a furnace, and to keep that factory running, we had to keep things burning. So we needed a way to keep the furnace burning 24-7 without us having to put in more wood by ourselves. Hi, Nog here. The solution was simple actually. Step 1. Build a tree farm. Trees would grow, and the saws would spin and cut them down. Step 2. Transporting the wood. Once the trees were cut down, the blocks would cross a bridge to the factory via conveyor belt. Step 3. 
the blocks would be moved across the factory floor, drop into the hoppers, and be deposited into the generator. Infinite power! But before we could do any of that cool stuff, like Noah said, I had to build the bridge. Thankfully, next to our near infinite supply of granite coming from Noah's auto miner, we had lots of materials to work with. Now Noah insisted that we build something simple. I mean, we just needed a bridge to get wood from point A to point B, but I don't like to roll that way. If we were gonna have a bridge, it was gonna be a nice bridge. One that matched with our granite factory. Now the only thing that was bothering me was the idea of the conveyor belt actually going over the bridge. It was gonna look ugly having a conveyor belt there. So I made sure to leave some space underneath the floor so that the conveyor belt could just go right through it. We would walk over it, we wouldn't have to see it. And in the end, we ended up with a beautiful walkway. One that was beautiful and functional. It was everything we needed it to be. After that, I decided to check on Noah's storage system. We had some pretty big projects in mind and we were gonna need a lot of blocks. But before we could design our next factory, we needed to finish the assembly line. This new assembly line would require us to use a new type of design. You see, we had used the mechanical fan before, but not in this way. Instead of using the fan to push items forward, we were gonna use it to push items up. In order for this to work, the items were gonna need something to pass through. So we took some chutes, we stacked them up, and we created a type of vents. This would allow the electron tubes to pass straight up into the second floor. From there, the electron tubes would go through a series of belts and chests and sorters until they finally reached their final destination, the hands of the deployers. Our assembly line was finally complete. With the steady flow of electron tubes, we now had precision mechanisms, basically an upgraded version of the kinetic mechanisms we made in the first video. I was getting ready to plan the next factory, and then Robert returned. He wanted to pay his respects to the corpse he had left behind in the last video. It was truly a touching moment. One of reflection, remorse, and ultimately, rebirth. Robert was ready to move on and join us in our industrial ambitions, so we gave him a tour of the factory. Robert took a look around, and he made sure our factory was up to code. Although, now that I look back on it, he may have been a corrupt safety inspector, because we caught him tampering with our machines. The tour ended with a special viewing of our factory grounds from the windmill's observation deck, but that wasn't good enough for Robert. He insisted that he get a view fit for a king, so we climbed over the safety rail and clawed his way to the top of the windmill's roof. Robert found numerous safety violations in our factory, and he wanted a bribe if we were to pass our inspection. In exchange for his discretion, Noah paid him everything he deserved. It was time to build the next factory. Now, we are not the most technically innovative group of Minecrafters. You see, we were kind of hitting some bottlenecks. We needed more items, and we couldn't get them fast enough. So, instead of making them, why not just buy them? Our problem was that we were a little short on cash. Most of our money was made by selling armor, but it just took way too long crafting the armor and then putting each piece in there one by one only to get a measly eight pieces of silver. So we decided to tinker with the concept of making a money machine. We would accomplish this by making a second iron farm identical to the one we had made last time. Only this one was going to be hooked up to a series of conveyor belts that would transport the iron and craft armor for us automatically. We began by building the iron farm, and then digging a simple hole underneath for our mechanical crafters. After that, we set up a series of chests connected to hoppers, which were linked to the mechanical crafters. The idea was that the iron from the chests would automatically go into the crafter and make the pants for us. The only tricky issue that we encountered was actually getting the iron into the chests. There were many ways of going about this, and we are not the brightest when it comes to doing redstone. So this was going to be quite the hurdle to overcome. Looking back on it now, we may have overcomplicated the design. There was probably a more simple way to do this, one that required less hoppers, but that's what we ended up with. So in short, iron goes from the iron farm onto the conveyor belts, and then from the conveyor belts it goes through the hoppers, and then from the hoppers it goes into the chests, and then from the chests into the mechanical crafter, where they would be converted into iron pants. The iron pants would then go into the trade station, and there they would be traded for silver coins, which would then be deposited into a little bank chest, and voila, we had a money machine. Now, it looked pretty ugly being exposed out in the open like that, so we decided to make a new building around it. In the basement level where we had the mechanical crafters, we decided to polish that up as well. We even put some chests, making a little storage room. 
Shortly after, I wanted to reap the fruits of our labor, so I took some of the coins we had earned from the machine and converted them into gold coins. And with one gold coin, we were able to buy diamonds. And not only diamonds, but also bottles of XP. After that, we continued the construction of our new bank using the materials in the storage room below, and in the end, we had constructed something that we were proud of. A new source of income. Once we had finished building the bank, I decided to take a look around and see what else needed sprucing up. Now, there were some water wheels sticking out of the ground. They were powering the iron farm, but I didn't like that they were exposed like that. So instead of digging a hole to bury them deeper, I just decided to build a dam. A hydroelectric dam. One where the water wheels would act as turbines, powering the iron farm. Now, when it comes to the technical side of things, the water wheels were still going to function just as regular water wheels. Other than that, this was more of a cosmetic choice. I had to do a ton of digging. We were going to place the dam where the mountain was, and well, let's just say it was a very tedious process. After that, we filled the reservoir, and I built a little path around the edges, just wide enough to walk across. I then went inside the walls of the dam. I placed the water wheels, and then I hooked them up to the rest of the machines shortly before pouring the water. With the dam finally complete and the water wheels spinning, I decided to decorate it now. Built a pair of towers, one for each side of the dam itself. Although I didn't like the gap between the two towers, so I filled that in with a little colonnade. In the end, I ended up with something that resembled more of a cathedral than a dam, but a win is a win. I thought it looked nice. While the main structure was finally complete, there were a couple of last touches that I wanted to add, including these little waterfalls on each side, as well as a canal for the waterfalls to pour into. The last and final addition to this dam was the street lamps. You see, it was really dark in that area. I went to the top of the windmill and overlooked at everything we had already achieved, everything we built, and I thought to myself, we're running out of space here. We still had a few more factories to build, and if we wanted to keep progressing, then we had to look towards the forest and all those pesky trees that were in the way. We still had half an island, and we were done sharing it with nature. I gathered my tools and I got to work. We were going to lay the foundations for our new factory, and if we were going to do that, then I needed to be properly equipped, and that included my armor. We weren't fighting against too many mobs, so I didn't feel the need to waste iron on armor. Instead, I decided to craft myself a hazmat suit, for two reasons. Number one, it would protect me, and number two, it looked cool. We were also running out of space with our chests. We were accumulating so much wood from the wood farm and tons of stone from Noah's auto miner, so we needed to think of something quickly before we ran out of space. And that's when it occurred to me that there was a better storage system in this mod the entire time. Storage drawers. They may not look like much, but they are very spacious on the inside. Not only that, but they could be upgraded, and these upgrades would meet capacities well beyond that of a regular chest. With one storage drawer, and mind you, it had very few upgrades, we were able to have 448 stacks of wood. After tinkering with the storage, it was time to start building the foundation of our new factory. We were entering chapter three known as the Catharsis. And here, we were gonna be experimenting with technologies way beyond our skill set. This was gonna be the biggest factory yet, but I decided to pause because Noah wanted to show me something. Turns out he was working on a little side project. Similar to the wood farm, Noah made a wheat farm. But this one was automatic as well. All you had to do was have the blades spin around, they would harvest the wheat, and then the machine would put it in the chest for us. He also discovered something called a schematic cannon. Don't let the appearance fool you. This was not a weapon. It was a tool. A tool for automated building. All you had to do was build something. Scan it with a blueprint, and then the cannon? It would build the design for you. And one of its best features? You could even transfer blueprints from creative worlds into survival worlds. And that's exactly what I did. Now before people call me out for cheating, oh, he didn't do it legit, oh, he's violating the rules. You have to understand that if you want it to be built, then you have to have the items in your survival world already. If you're still confused, you'll see what I mean. I decided to give this new method a test run. So I designed a new wood shop, a place where we could sort all of our wood items, including all of the extra stuff, such as apples, sticks, saplings. You get the idea. After finishing the build, I got myself an empty schematic. and I right-clicked each side so as to save the entire building. After that, I saved it and I imported it into the other survival world. Now, one thing I want to heavily clarify as to why this is legit. The schematic cannon does not spawn blocks for you. You can put the blueprint in, it'll save the design, but it won't build it unless you have a chest next to it. And inside the chests are all the items that you need to build the thing. 
you have to supply those items yourself. So, from here on out, every build that we were gonna do, all we had to do was supply the blocks, the cannon was just gonna use those blocks and make the build for us. And sooner or later, you basically have a 3D printed building. But what's a wood shop without a wood farm? So I designed another wood farm, and I'm gonna be honest, this was not my design. I got it from another Minecraft YouTuber, so yeah, thanks to you for that. His design was pretty simple. All you had to do was make sure that you had some saws attached to a cart, and the cart would go back and forth, and the saws with it, chopping down all the saplings. All the arms, well, they would automatically replant those saplings. After that, all the wood and all the apples and all the saplings, they would go up into the mountain, right into the wood shop, where they would be filtered using the drawers we discovered. Now that we knew this thing was going to work for us, it was time to really put it to the test. I had finished building the new foundation for the factory, and so I decided to save it into a separate schematic and import it into the creative world. I designed a factory that would meet all of our needs for the next age. After that, I imported that back into the survival world, and I let the schematic cannon do its thing. This thing took hours to build, because we don't always have the materials to keep the cannon fueled. While the cannon was out spewing blocks, I made sure to stand by, making sure that the chest still had all the right blocks it needed. After hours of work, the cannon's job was finally complete. This was by far my favorite build out of everything else we had already constructed in this world. The inside was spacious. Noah didn't waste any time building his first machine, although there were some complications, but that's life. If we were going to complete Chapter 3, then we had many tasks to finish. Noah said that one of the first things we needed were crushing wheels. I didn't know where he was going with this, but I made them anyway and brought them to the factory. Turns out, we were going to use the crushing wheels to make Singularities a new item. And what you're looking at is the assembly line that makes them. Here's how it works. It all begins with a mechanical crafter producing crushing wheels. Once the wheels are crafted, they're deposited onto a conveyor belt. There, they're moved along to other crushing wheels where they are immediately grounded up. This makes a singularity. The singularity then moves up the belt and down the line until it ends up next to a dispenser with TNT. We do have to blow the item up, but not before adding a second ingredient. This machine on the floor below was responsible for making ender dust. The main ingredient was slimy ferns. After cutting up the fern into leaves, they're grounded, and that produces a type of purple blend. When you put the blend to a heat source, it cooks them, and then it becomes ender dust. You throw the ender dust in with the singularity, and then to actually combine them, you need to blow them up. This ends up creating an entangled singularity, which in turn is used to create a quantum singularity. This brings us back to the same machine that made the ender dust. Only this time, we swapped out the purple fern for a blue fern. Reason being, because we weren't going to make ender dust, now we needed to make bone meal. All you have to do is take the blend and put it on a heat source, such as a campfire or a stove. This converts it into bone meal. With all that bone meal, we were going to be spam clicking a flower. This was going to be used to make more flowers, because we needed an unlimited supply of dye. I ended up putting a stove next to the conveyor belt. The bone meal would go down the belt, into the deployer, and onto the flower. Now, we couldn't control the direction of where the flowers popped, so we just surrounded it with hoppers all around, hoping that it would go into the chest. After that, we connected the flower chest to another mechanical belt. The idea was that the flowers would come out of the chest, go onto the belt, and enter the mechanical crafter. There, they would be converted into dye and put in another chest until they're needed again. And needed they were because we had a ton of entangled singularities. And to make the next item, you had to combine those with the dye. And after crushing them together, you get the chromatic singularity. The chromatic singularities were then transferred from their drawer to another belt, where they would be crushed once again. Our next step was to crush them to produce paintballs. One chromatic singularity was able to produce five colors, with magenta being the one we needed. We had a lot to pulverize, so I set up another pair of mechanical crushers. They'd pass through, they'd get crushed, and paintballs, they'd come out the other end. They stayed in storage, because we needed to figure out a way to correct their color. Remember, they all needed to be magenta. With the help of an item drain, that was possible. By right-clicking it with a paintball, the color would change. All you had to do was keep clicking it until you got magenta. Although by doing this, the paintballs did make a weird liquid that we had to get rid of. It was now time to create a filtering system. And just like our second assembly line, once again, we were going to be using the power of fans and chutes to push them upward. The end result was a very complicated looking machine. Paintballs would come out of the drawers, go into the funnels, and be pushed up by the fans. They would then come out and be dropped into the item drains. 
their color would be corrected, and then they would drop down into the next funnel for the next phase. There were multiple levels with multiple item drains, because some colors needed to be corrected more than others. For example, a red paintball would need to be corrected about four times, whereas a blue paintball would only have to be corrected once. In the end, they would all come out as magenta. As for the waste itself, every item drain was connected to a series of pipes, and those pipes were connected to tanks that would store the waste. Before we moved on, there was a side project that I wanted to tackle. I prepped the schematic and let the cannon do its thing. Now what did we need all those magenta paintballs for? I set up a conveyor belt, put up some mechanical crafters, and let the paintballs craft themselves into chromatic compounds. Chromatic compounds being the next item we needed. Once made, the compounds needed to be converted into refined radiance. To do this, the compound required light sources, whether that be torches or glowstone, anything that emits light. It would absorb the light, and sometimes even the blocks, until it converted into refined radiance. It would take a while, unless you had a beacon, which would convert them instantly. And to get a beacon, well, we had to kill a wither. We had rarely gone into the nether, and I had yet to see a wither skeleton, but we could craft their skulls. Thankfully, we were able to buy one of the crafting ingredients. All we really needed was skeleton skulls. As for the money, well, it's a good thing we had a money machine, huh? I went to the bank, made a withdrawal, and then I went into my menu to buy one of the imports for that recipe. After that, I converted my silver to gold, with one stack being worth one piece of gold. These items were expensive! Two gold for one withered rib? We couldn't buy the skeleton skulls, so we had to go get them ourselves, which required a new weapon. But before I went to go make that, I wanted to check the progress of our side project. And that schematic cannon was doing God's work. It was such a time saver. Just look at all that progress! I went back to the old workshop and dusted off the old tinker setup we had from the first video. I vaguely remembered how to do this, so yeah, if you want to know why I'm so slow about it, it's because I'm still trying to figure it out. What I did remember was that we needed an anvil to make the tool, as well as the parts for him. We didn't need anything fancy, so this new weapon was going to be made out of iron. The iron was melted down, poured into the cast, and the pieces were made. After that, we combined them in the anvil to make a new weapon called a cleaver. Now the reason we needed a cleaver was because it had a special ability called severing. If you kill a mob with the sword, then there's a chance it may drop its head. In this case, we needed skeleton skulls, so this was going to be the tool for the job. We only needed two skeleton skulls since we had a third wither skull just laying around. And if you don't believe me, you can look back in the video, or in the last one, it's, it's there. It's just there. Anyways, I crafted the wither skulls, and then I put the three skulls together. All we needed now was soul sand. I made a quick journey to the nether to gather some, didn't want to get killed, and then I finally put on some armor after a while, and Xavier he had left the diamond helmet in his chest, and he hadn't joined, so he, I'm sure he wouldn't mind. I ended up having to buy obsidian because I was going to use a technique that we used in better Minecraft. We were going to spawn the wither under some bedrock and trap him there. I took the skulls, went into the nether portal, and then after that I started stacking up to the ceiling to reach the bedrock level. Once I had reached the top, I had to start digging. Needed to find a flat surface where I could spawn the wither, one where he wouldn't escape. Once I found my spot, I began setting up. Placed the soul sand, then the skulls, and then I backed up because I did not want to get caught up if this had gone wrong. Thankfully, once he finished spawning, everything went according to plan. He was stuck in the ceiling, and there was nothing he could do about it. After that, it didn't take long before the wither was defeated and I had gotten my nether star. He also dropped a pack of buddy cards, though I had not used that mod at all, so it didn't mean anything to me. I went back into the overworld, and by the time I had completed my quest, it looked like the clock tower was finally finished. After that, I regrouped with Noah. I gave him all the materials to craft the beacon, and from there, it was smooth sailing. He put the beacon together, switched it on, and then I gathered some chromatic compound. It was time to give it a try. But before we turned him into refined radiance, we needed to give him a little ceiling because every time you had refined radiance and you tossed it, it would float up into the air. I'm so happy we made the beacon because the conversion time was instant. After that, we just needed to process the refined radiance with a press. We pressed them down into these thin sheets, and then after that, it was time to refine them once more with a mechanical crafter. Once processed, they were then converted into something called radiant induction coils. After that, we put them into the deployers with a magnet, and from there, we could make induction mechanisms, tier 3 of the mechanisms we were making. Now, we did rush a little bit at the end, and in the next video, if you guys want a next video, we will refine this process even further so that all the machines are connected. 
By this point, we had already run out of time. But I think it's safe to say that we accomplished a lot in these last 100 days. But there was still so much more that we could do. As the sun set on another adventure, Noah and I took comfort in the fact that even though we didn't finish this mod pack, well, we still had more to look forward to in the future. Well, there you have it, folks. 200 days in the Create mod. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you want a part 3, then leave a like, be sure to comment, and we'll see you next time. Thank you guys for watching.